Hi everyone, I'm Josh and welcome to Josh Wright Piano TV. Thank you so much for joining me today. I wanted to talk about nine tips for optimism and inspiration in your practice sessions. Not only is this an extremely difficult time for the world, what with war, COVID and inflation and so many other issues plaguing us, a lot of times we can get bogged down in the act that should be relaxing us and providing spiritual and mental and emotional nourishment to us, which is our music study. So I wanted to go over these nine tips to help in your practicing, to help make you more productive and more inspired and just have a better experience during your practice sessions. Um, the first one is to listen to great music to be inspired. This can be, uh, this is an obvious one, but a lot of times if you're listening to a recording, you will get new ideas about how to approach your pieces, you can copy those ideas and they will gradually become your own. One of my favorite stories was Logan Skelton told me, he, uh, he's my teacher at Michigan, and he told me he was obsessed with this Richter recording of Prokofiev Seventh Sonata. And he said, I did everything Richter did. I copied every little thing he did. I sounded very much like his recording uh, when I would play it and record it myself. And he said, like so far as the musical ideas and things like that, and he said, I didn't listen to the recording for three months after my first performance. I went back and I had thought all along that, you know, I kept sounding like this. But he said, after three months, I sounded totally different. I couldn't even, it didn't even bear as much resemblance, not even close to as much resemblance as before. So it goes to show you that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Listen to great music, copy what you like, and it will become your own. Because we all experience music in a different way, even if you are taking someone else's idea, it will gradually morph into your own style. So always listen to great music to be inspired. Number two, have mentors and trusted contacts. I've spoken a bit about this in the past, but I have four people um, in my life that I listen to when it comes to music. I'll listen to everybody, I'll, I'll hear everybody, but I only put emphasis and a lot of meaning on the opinions of four people, which are my wife, Lindsay. She's not only my wife, but she is a great, fantastic musician, and she has great ears. She can always, probably just because she's heard me practice you know, a million hours over the last 12 years of being married to her, um, she's, uh, she knows my playing intimately. Um, Susan Duelmeyer, my first uh, teacher after I went to my grandma uh, for four or five years when I was very young, and then I went to Susan, and I studied with her for many years, and I still go see her. She's just an inspiration to me in so many ways. Um, Sergei Babayan, uh, who I've done um, you know, a handful of lessons with. I did his academy twice. I observed probably 100 hours worth of his teaching. And I've taken many lessons outside of his academy as well. Um, just a brilliant teacher. And finally, th that was chronological order. Besides my wife, she comes number, she's number one. Um, <laughs> but uh, finally, Logan Skelton, uh, who was my teacher during my doctoral studies at Michigan. I actually met him for a lesson um, not too long ago. And it was very inspiring and eye-opening, as always. Um, all the lessons at Michigan were very inspiring. So having people that are in your kind of inner circle that you trust, rather than taking everyone's opinion. That can get really overwhelming. I can tell you from being on YouTube, um, I think our, the channel's up to a, around 160,000 subscribers. Everybody has an opinion. A lot of people will hate you. I'm sure there's tons of people that hate me online. However, having said that, you have to choose who you're actually going to listen to and trust, um, whose opinion you want to listen to. Um, number three, this is a little bit out of the ordinary that you may not think about, but physically exerting yourself outside of the piano and having good nutrition can help tremendously. I, about four or five years ago, got pretty heavily into uh, working out and weightlifting. Um, nothing crazy. I have a power rack uh, in a storage room that I do, you know, the core five exercises with and some accessory exercises with, like uh, the core exercises I do like deadlifts, squats, overhead press, chest press, rows, and then I'll do some biceps, triceps, uh, calf work um, as some accessory movements. But just that simple routine, it's not a crazy routine. I weight lift uh, three times a week and then I just do a bit of cardio on those off days, like 20 or 30 minutes. And then looking at my nutrition, has greatly helped my mental clarity at the piano. I don't look like a bodybuilder. I don't look like, you know, 
a skinny wimp that you're going to beat up, but I also don't look like so in shape. You're like, wow, he must work out. I don't look like that. I do this not to look great, but to feel really good and uh, to clear up my mental space. Um, it really provides a release of, I mean, uh, the release of endorphins, but um, a release of some of the pressures and anxieties that modern society can bring. Um, the next tip is to go slow and listen. So for instance, I'm working on the Scriabin uh, Etude, Opus uh, 8, number 12. Going really slow in here. Rather than just, you know, you know, if you're really feeling the piece, it's very tempting just to play it fortissimo and just bang your way through it. But I think that piece has a lot of meaning. Um, this is a very, very new piece for me. I'm actually a little nervous to even demonstrate it because I just barely finished memorizing it. But um, maybe a little bit of meaning on that and then. Okay, so you can go, in order to think about how you're going to do that, I like to often close my eyes when I do this. Hey, I swear it increases your hearing abilities when you close your eyes. You're so much more aware of things, maybe practicing in the dark. But starting a little less. Also playing another scrab and piece, the impromptu opus um, 12, number two. And it is haunting and mysterious. And even though it's a, a fairly slow piece to start with, going extra slow, I remember I presented at this online global piano stump. Oh my gosh, Global Piano Summit with Steven Spooner. Um, there was a whole list of amazing teachers there. I was presenting on online uh, teaching um, and all the gear that I used to set up. But um, Steven Spooner and I often reminisced after our sessions about uh, Sergei Babayan and all of his inspiring stories that we've experienced with him. And he said, you know, um, he would often talk about going in glacial tempos. I loved that. Uh, word glacial tempos because I've seen glaciers in Greenland that was one of my bucket list items we went to Greenland very expensive to get to very tiny place um, but we went to I'm I know I'm mispronouncing this but Ilulisat um, it was fascinating the icebergs would change every single day so you'd see a new landscape of icebergs but when you watched them they're still they're just moving so slowly and what that does, when you go in a slow tempo, it gives you time to process information. Of course, this sounds so obvious, but you're able to hear things differently. You're able to process more information. You're able to memorize much quicker. You're able to extract sounds from the piano that you didn't know you maybe could. So going slowly and listening to yourself. The next point, number five, uh, experiment in your practice sessions. I remember asking Jolt Bognar, he runs a fantastic YouTube channel called Living the Classical Life. Everybody should go subscribe and check that out. Um, but I, he was a longtime student of Sergei Babayan. And early on in my studies with Babayan, um, I asked him, I said, have you ever watched um, you know, Sergei practice? And what is that like? And he said, yeah, I have. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge series of experiments. He's always finding new pathways, new ways of doing things. It's not drilling. It's an experiment, and I've always loved that. I always thought that was um, beautiful advice, very well said. Uh, number six, take breaks and cr to create mental space. I had a colleague at the university, his name's Jeffrey, and he once told me, um, he said, I never practice for more than 20 minutes at a time. Now, you might be thinking, geez, how does he ever get anything done? But he said, it doesn't mean that I take long, I don't need an hour break after I take a 20-minute practice session. I'll take a two-minute break. I'll stand up. I'll stretch my legs. I'll do something. Uh, 
I'll go get a drink. I'll listen to a recording. I'll do something, but I never practice for more than 20 minutes at a time. And even if it is just closing your eyes, you can stay sitting at the piano, but just taking a breather, that can be huge for creating mental space and improving um, your practice experience. Uh, Number seven, deal with problems in pieces you are actually working on. This is advice I need. My wife will tell you. Um, Only work on what you're working on. Don't torture yourself with a a smattering of tough passages um, from pieces that give you trouble. So I'm notorious for, you know, being practicing and then, oh, I'm going to go play this tough part of this piece. Maybe I'll work on my double thirds. Maybe I'll just try this. A uh, little part from Faux Filet because I'm terrible at, you know, rapid um, alternating octaves that, that go really fast, as you can see, double thirds, that passage. And I'll torture myself, and then it kind of, you know, starts to ruin your self-esteem, whereas really these are a few isolated passages that have given me trouble over the years. And yes, I've found solutions that have drastically improved them um, over the years, but they're still really tough passages. And if something was giving me trouble in a previous piece, sometimes I'll go to that. And and sometimes pieces that I've been totally fine with um, in the past, but I'm like, is my technique... Yeah disintegrate like is my technique getting worse and I'll go back and I'll practice an old piece and I'll try to do it in tempo without having practiced it for years and I'm like oh no I can't do it and am I getting worse you can go through these psychotic mental cycles work on what you're working on this is advice I need so um anyway that's number seven um number eight this was uh, actually taught to me by a nutritionist that uh Lindsay and I saw many years ago um it was brilliant. And I said, you know, do you have any, I know she deals with nutrition, but I said, do you have any ideas on how to deal with performance anxiety? She said, you know, there's a lot of things you could do meditation. Um, she's really amazing, uh, yoga teacher and she teaches meditation, but she said a simple breathing exercise is breathe in two seconds through your nose, breathe out eight seconds or eight counts, whatever you want to deal with through your mouth. So, so I'll, I'll count with my hands. Okay. So She said that can rapidly decrease your heart rate and put you in a much more calm mental space. When you're inhaling a lot more often than you should be, you can work yourself up into a more frantic heart rate. So that's a practical little tip you can use. In two counts, out eight counts. In two counts through your nose, out eight counts through, I think, your mouth. I'd have to revisit that. It's actually on my YouTube channel, so you can go look at that. I I actually posted it from backstage um, at one of my performances many years ago. The last one is kind of a fun little bonus tip. Hang good art in your studio. I actually have uh, a piece coming from one of my pro practice members that I'm so excited about. I have a beautiful painting that I actually played for an art gallery, and they're like, We can't pay you, but we can give you art trade. And I needed to test out this new program. So I was like, yeah, sure. And I thought it was a little weird at the time, but I love that it's hanging right there. I can see it every single day. And then recently I hung a bunch of pictures of inspiring pianists and my teachers up here uh, to the diagonal of my piano diagonal view of my piano that I can see. And I don't know, just seeing, you know, Sergei Babayan, Daniel Trifonov, Murray Paria, Susan, Logan. Argerich, uh, just seeing them there every day always kind of inspires me um, to uh, keep going and to think about actually stories they've told me about self-doubt. Sometimes if I'm having a hard time, I can look and I can reminisce about certain stories they've told me like when they've said they've had a hard time with something or I remember a specific recording one of them made or ex- an experience I had in a lesson that was very inspiring. That wall used to be blank. I, I'm a very minimalist person. I don't really hang too much stuff up on my walls. I kind of like the blank canvas. But I've noticed in my studio, it really helps to have some good art to look at very inspiring. So just a fun little extra one there at the end. I hope these tips have been helpful. If any of you have any questions, my email is josh at joshwrightpiano.com. Have a great week. Good luck in your practice sessions.